If you would have um, walked down the street a few blocks towards the pond about 150 years ago, you would have encountered several hundred uh, workers labor laboring at Jamaica Pond. Some men would be out on the surface of the pond, clearing the snow from the ice surface. Others would be scoring and cutting huge blocks of ice to pass along to other men who would load them onto conveyors. The conveyors would lift the ice to the insulated ice houses on the pond shore, or the ice might be loaded directly onto horse-drawn wagons for deliveries to homes and businesses. This lithograph uh, depicts um, an ice pond, not at Jamaica Plain, but in Massachusetts in the 1850s. And it gives you a good idea of the scene that might have played out before your eyes. And the nice thing about this particular etching is that it shows all the different steps in the process. And we'll, we're gonna be speaking about each of them as we, as we go, but, um, but you have people. Oops, <laughs> you have people uh, scraping the snow off the ice, scoring the ice, cutting the ice, putting that, uh, floating the ice to the conveyors, putting them on the conveyors, packing them into the ice houses. So um, there you go. Um, Oops. So we might think of, of ice as a modern convenience, but more than 2,400 years ago, Persian engineers had mastered the technique of storing refreshing mountain ice in super insulated buildings with uh, six foot thick walls. Ice was harvested from mountain ponds and brought down for use in the hot desert climate where temps commonly reach 110 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is a, a ice house that's still existing and it is in uh, Abarku, Iran. So harvesting of ice is, a, is an ancient phenomenon, but only during the 19th century did it get uh, see widespread use. Before the 19th century, two kinds of people could afford to have ice, the very rich and those who harvested it themselves. This is because ice harvesting was, a, was labor intensive and transporting such a heavy commodity was expensive. It was not uncommon for farmers with ponds to harvest a limited uh, amount of ice during winter months. And shown here is a small ice harvesting operation on a farm in Noble County, Minnesota in 1925. I don't know that we have a problem. Are you solving oh, a problem that you don't have, we don't have? Oh, oh, I was told that the microphone is not working. Ah. I need the microphone, but. You, you, you can't hear me in the back? Uh, oh my. Just not on at all. Are you screaming again? Testing one, two. Testing. Um, uh, this one. Who knows? That's an HTML. That's an HTML. Like yeah. Um, okay. No. No, there isn't. Um, Okay, I'm going to keep. I don't know. I'm going to. <laughs> I'm going to keep talking. Okay, sorry okay. about that. Thank you for your help. So, um, so this is um, so ice which was first stored in underground vault. If you think of like a, a root cellar, that type of a setup, and without modern equipment, digging um, huge underground cellars was time consuming and costly, and cellars were sometimes prone to flooding. 
Nathaniel Wyeth conceived the idea of erecting above ground wood double walled buildings with space between the inner and outer walls being filled with, with uh, straw or sawdust. Both products were easily available, modestly priced, and could be easily replaced when damaged by the elements. Wyeth developed and tested these new structures at Frederick Tudor's Ice Works at Fresh Pond in Cambridge. He is also credited with inventing a horse-drawn ice plow that allowed a tutor to triple his pr uh, production of ice. A properly insulated ice house will preserve ice for more than two years. This allows ice operations to stock up on ice during especially cold winters. We know that ice lasted that long because the size of stocks going into the ice harvesting season were widely reported by local newspapers as they greatly impacted the wholesale price of ice. Sorry, technical difficulties with the Zoom. Okay. <laughs> um, if it wasn't a challenge, it wouldn't be any fun, right? <laughs> yeah. So. This is an old fashioned ice operation and, and it was not very, it was, this ice is expensive ice. This is before mechanization. So you see to pull the ice up to the, to the ice house, you have a, um, they're using a horse and it's attached to a chain and a rope and some thong, tongs and it, not very accurate, you know, slow, dangerous. Um, so, all of this was was modern. There's no, uh, yeah. So there's no conveyor and and so forth. So all this was modernized, and you'll see uh, in the coming slides, you know how each each part of this equation has been modernized and and um, uh, so they could produce ice at scale. So this is an 1850 map of Jamaica Plain, and it shows E.M. Stoddard and company uh, on Jamaica Pond. This is the first ice house to appear on a map on the shore of the pond. And you'll see the red. Oh, I have this fancy do that here too. So <laughs> over here, you see the location. And there later some other ice houses appeared on the, uh, on the shore of the pond, the left-hand side, and we'll, we'll see that in a moment. Okay. So in February 1855, the Boston Globe reported that the Jamaica Plain Ice Company was employing about 350 men during the peak of the season. These men worked harvesting ice on the pond, packing the ice into ice houses, delivering ice to wholesale buyers and the public. The men are paid on average $1.75 per day. So here we see um, the Jamaica Plain Ice Company delivery wagon they used to deliver ice to homes. And then here is a, um, a more elaborate uh, branded um, buggy that, uh, that's used to, to deliver ice to homes. And this is in uh, Sangamon County, Illinois. And I apologize for the pronunciation there. So Phineas B. Smith was active in the ice business as early as 1855. He was a partner with E.M. Stoddard and later Mr. Smith became president of the Jamaica Pond Ice Company. So this map here, we see, uh, 1874, and now we see uh, two locations where, where ice houses are on the map here and the original location here. So just doubling in size of the operation. 
Uh, the Jamaica Pond Ice Company had 22 ice houses at, with a combined capacity of 30,000 tons. So to try to, uh, tons are sometimes hard to get in your head. So if you think of that figure in terms of 25 pound blocks of ice, shown in the previous photos, the ice house held 2.4 million blocks of these, these huge blocks of ice. So ice, understand, ice was a big business in, in, the, in Jamaica Plain and, and throughout uh, New England. The Jamaica Pond Ice Company supplied ice to um, Brookline, West Roxbury, JP, the South End, Roxbury, and Dorchester. In 1874, the Boston Globe reports that 600 men were employed by the company in the peak of the season, with 75 men being employed during the summer. The company had a special brewery division. <laughs> and it alone had 100 teams of horses that were used to supply to breweries in the area. Some 25 uh, breweries operated in the immediate area. Whoops, one ahead, there we go. So this is a bird's eye view, 1891. And um, you get a more 3D representation of, of what the, the ice houses looked like, again, in, in, the, in the two locations. So this, um, these are two, th this one and the following photo is, is, uh, was taken in 1905. And this gives you an idea of what the ice operation looked like from the from the what is now the um, the Arbor Way side, the you know the the Jamaica Way side of the property. So not the not the pond side. So this in the on this building here, you see the name of the of the company, and the, these are offices, and they're sort of like a split between here and then the back part of this building. It was used as a uh, ice warehouse. And you know, and this is the this, this street in the front. So, and there's another view as well. And this helps you see how the ice uh, houses had hollow wall construction. So you, you can see right now they've taken the outer wall off, and they're cleaning out all this all the straw and insulate and sawdust, and uh, they're packing it in with fresh material, and then they're gonna put the cladding back on. So double wall construction, big, thick insulated walls kept the, kept the ice from melting. So in um, the Jamaica Pond Ice Company was listed in the Boston Directory of 1875. It had offices at 2389 Washington. This is at uh, Shawmet, it's about one block from Dudley. Mr. Smith was a prominent attorney and public records show. He represented various parties in significant litigations. His son was also attorney and uh, kept his offices at the same location. We also find his residential address at 30 Marcella Street, and that runs off of Washington Street, and it's not too far from Jackson Square. Um, this is an ad for an ice box, and it represents um, as ice harvesting grew and as prices fell, it became more and more common for the average um, home to have an ice box like this and to have ice uh, delivered to their homes. Um, it wasn't only for the very rich, but I'm sure you needed you know, some amount of disposable income uh, because ice is, you know, it's it's a luxury, even though it, it's used to preserve food and uh, keep it from keep it fresh. Um, ice companies provided signs, and that you put in the window, just like the old milk delivery signs, uh, and you know whether or not you wanted uh, an an ice delivery or not. Often the back door to the home was left open, and payment for the ice would be left on on the kitchen table. Those were the days, my yeah, friend. Yeah, yeah. Can't do that anymore. <laughs> During the, the late 1800s, dozens of companies entered the ice, uh, 
high spots manufacturing uh, business, uh, the main manufacturing company soon became uh, one of several market leaders. In 1894, the company um, saw a need to get closer to the Boston market, and they relocated to Nashville in New Hampshire. Um, this is a, a typical design of an icebox of the period. And I don't know about you, about your grandmother, but my grandmother continued to refer to our refrigerator as an icebox as long as she lived. So it took me a while before I learned that there was another name for that thing, it was refrigerator. So this photo is dated 1918. Two young women have been pressed into service delivering ice due to the wartime shortage of male labor. An article in that 1880 Boston Daily Globe reported that the standards in the ice delivery business have changed greatly in the past few years. Previously, a single man was employed to drive the ice wagon and dump dirty blocks of ice on doorsteps. Well, that won't do anymore. Now it is the practice to have two men on each wagon. One of those men will drive the wagon. He will be experienced, trustworthy, and well-dressed. <laughs> the other man, I guess he was not so well-dressed, was, no, was known as the striker. The striker will carry the cakes from the wagon into the house and place it in the ice box. Before doing so, he will ensure that the blocks of ice are cleaned and dressed. In, uh, and also from the Boston Globe, 1874, a report that the Jamaica Plain Ice Company was cutting about 5,000 tons of ice a day and will probably fill all of their ice houses by next week. Wow. The, the ice is 10 inches thick and clear. The pond will be cleared by the end of this season. So it was typical for the financial page of the Boston Globe to report on the wholesale price of ice uh, in the region, in New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Boston. And the prices uh, varied widely from $4 to $12 per ton. Reduced to round numbers, the cost of ice to consumers in these four cities is $20 million. Add to this amount all that is consumed in the other large cities of the Union to say nothing about the lesser cities and towns, and one can realize that the amount of ice traffic of the country as to re, re, as, as reduced to dollars and cents, it would be, it would be uh, quite uh, um, significant. Ice, ice harvesting was quite a local interest story and we find a number of new newspaper articles de, uh, detailing the various steps in harvesting the harvesting process. So, so we know quite a bit about the tools and procedures that, that uh, are used. So it was, it was relatively easy when I did the original research for this just to go through the Boston Globe and they would have like, you know, like a Scientific America, you know, article about every step in the ice process. So if you really wanted to get into the nitty gritty of this, there was really a lot of information. And the, and the articles were recurring, you know, five years later, another one, 10 years later, another one. And how, as the technology changed, they would talk about what was new, you know, what was happening in Charlestown now with the ice business. So. Um, it's, it wasn't a hard uh, topic to, uh, to research. It was common for spectators to gather at the pond during the harvest. Fine carriages would pull up on the roadways around the pond to watch the, the ice being brought in. I, there wasn't as much to do back then. <laughs> and those of lesser means would wander out on the ice or down skates to get a, a better view of the, of the activity. Okay, so here is the first step of the ice production. You have ice, but when you have ice, you often have snow. So there's snow on, on top of the ice. So you can't cut the ice with the snow on the top, so you have to plow the snow. So they had special equipment, horse-drawn equipment that would, that would move the, the uh, plow the snow off the top of the ice, and that would be what you needed to do first. Um, in, in the early years, the snow was just seen, seen as a hindrance, but then they started noting that the, that the snow served as an insulator. So if they left the snow on until, the, until they needed to harvest, the ice would stay stick, uh, thicker and not as much would melt. So um, they changed their view about, 
uh, getting rid of, of the snow. Um, so when you're harvesting ice, you're looking for a preferred thickness of 15 inches, but you don't get that every winter, depends on how cold it is. Uh, so if it was at least 12 inches, it was worthwhile to, to harvest. Um, some of the ice was bound for export, and I'll talk more about that shortly. And that ice needed to be thicker because it was going to melt in transit on ships. And um, it wasn't practical to have thinner uh, ice uh, for export. So there's another technique they used other than the plowing, and it was called sinking the pond. And what they did was they drilled a series of holes in the ice, and the water would come up and sort of bond the snow and freeze it and, and, and make it attached to the, to the ice below. Um, so some people thought that would produce good ice. Some people said that wasn't as good as the other way. So, you know, so that both methods were, were employed. Okay. So after you get the snow off the pond, then you score the ice. And this is on Jamaica Pond, and you'll see the scoring in the on the ice surface there, and you'll see some other stuff too, a, a, a horse, and um, you'll see a stream where they float the ice up to the conveyor house, and the conveyor, it takes the ice up into the ice houses. So the scoring was done, they picked out an area that was 600 feet on each side, so 600 square feet. Um, they surveyed it, and they set up boundary markers and they used a hand cutter just to score the ice. It's kind of like just marking it to show where they're gonna you know, cut the, the blocks. Um, th there was a, a, a blade that, that acted as a guide and there was a large tooth edge, which, which made the groove. The first cut was two inches uh, deep. Then they had another twin blade cutter come and then finally, an ice plow and its blades were adjusted, not to cut all the way through, but to cut about uh, four inches from the bottom of the, of the ice. And then later they could, they could still break off the, the pieces. This would keep it together until they are ready to break it off with these long uh, rods and float it up the, uh, to the conveyor. So um, men rode these, uh, these uh, pieces of ice uh, like a raft and uh, as they floated it up towards the ice house. And this float technique survived for more than, than 100 years. Um, this next picture. Shows um, the ice being floated up and then yeah, here's some other um, views. Here we have the ice house. We have some ice plows. And again, the, the open area where they would break off the ice and float it this way up to the, up to the conveyor. OK, so. Um, here the blocks are loaded on the uh, steam engine driven conveyor to transport the blocks up to the ice house. So you didn't have internal combustion engine yet, but you had the steam engine. So that was the first really big step of mechanization rather than hauling these things up into a warehouse by hand, which was, or by horse, you actually had a, a, a dependable engine that could sit, could drive the conveyor belts, and, and carry them up. Um, as you can see, it's, they were very tall ice houses. So it was a lot of work to get these huge blocks up to the top. Here's another view of an ice conveyor and you see the, the stream over here. This is, a, this is just water and they're, 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 they're bringing them up that way and then that conveyor picks them up here and carries them up to the ice house. Um, I'll let me finish and we'll take some questions. Thank you. Okay, 
So, um, so this is inside the ice house. You can see not a lot of lighting, but you'll see you have these um, sort of slides that they use and they would just slide the ice down and they would stack it up. So this could be 10 or 20 feet uh, deep. Um, and um, the, it would come in at the top and slide down. And as the ice built up here, they would ra keep raising the conveyors until it was almost entirely full. Okay, so in, a, in addition to the domestic market, um, there was also a robust export market of ice. And it's the thing that most people are most surprised about when you tell them about uh, harvesting ice in Jamaica Pine. The first document um, export of ice was 130 tons that was shipped on the brig Favorite in August of 1805 from Boston to the West Indies. The shipment was organized by 21-year-old Frederick Tudor. This is him as not as a 21-year-old, obviously, but he was the Bill Gates of his time. And as far as ice goes, he because he dropped out of Boston Latin and became uh, one of the wealthiest uh, men in the in the region. Um, he organized the first shipment of ice in response to an outbreak of yellow fever. And he went on to build an empire in ice. He became known as the Ice King. And um, he harvested ice in Saugust and uh, hauled it to Charlestown where it was loaded onto the favorite and sailed to Martinique. So that was, that was his, his first uh, beginning um, in the business. Um, however, his plan to ship ice um, faced widespread ridicule, sounds familiar. And it was only due to funding provided by his wealthy old, older brother that he was able to get the funds to launch his first ship. By 1812, he had developed, developed a thriving export trade and had built a number of ice houses uh, in Kingston, Jamaica, which was his, the center of his operations. Soon thereafter, he established a monopoly on ice trade in Havana, Cuba. Yeah. So here's some statistics on ice shipments. Uh, this is from the Boston Globe. Um, so Tudor was, was, was prospering even though he faced a number of geo, geopolitical obstacles. Uh, 1807, 1809, there was the, um, the Embargo Act because uh, France and uh, Britain were at war. And then there was the War of 1812. Um, but as you can see, there's shipping a lot of ice all over um, the Caribbean and as far as Rio de Janeiro. Did I skip a slide? Yes, okay. So um, from Scribner's Magazine, he's talking about the loading of, of ice for export at Charlestown. Perhaps one of the most interesting features um, as the cars pass down the track from the main road to the wharf, ships are waiting. They are separately weighed. Then the car is moved to a position opposite the gangway of the ship. It's talking about rail cars. A long platform rigged with iron rails is placed between the car and the gangway of the ship. Over this platform, the ice is slid from the car door to the ship's rail. And it goes on to describe a, a complicated counterweight mechanism that allowed for quick loading and unloading of ice. The average amount of ice loaded on board a ship in one day is 300 tons, but upon an emergency, I don't know how you have an ice emergency, but <laughs> apparently that can is the thing that can happen. Uh, 500 tons can easily uh, be disposed of. So, you see the, 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 the tools that are being uh, put into place from simple steam engines to massive conveyor systems and you know, overhead counterweighted things, um, you know, it became a um, much higher rate of production. And here is some more shipments of ice. 
and mostly the Caribbean. And yeah, so this is 1878 to 1873, 1878. Okay. So Tudor then turned his uh, distribution, uh, Tudor then, Tudor then turned towards uh, distribution in South Carolina, uh, 1870, and with New Orleans um, previously in 1820. Soon, New Orleans consumers were purchasing more ice than the citizens of any city south of Philadelphia. In 1833, Mr. Tudor began supplying ice to Calcutta, India, a voyage that took four months. More than half of the 100 tons was lost to melting on the voyage, and the Elgin uh, Ice House that was built to store the ice still stands today. And I'm told that if you drive in a cab from the airport to the city, you'll go by the ice house, and if you're from Boston or if you're from Massachusetts, the cab driver will stop and make a point to tell you everything about the ice house, everything about Mr. Tudor, and everything about the, the, the first ice that came to Calcutta. Uh, the following year, Mr. Tudor uh, sent the first shipment of ice to Rio de Janeiro, and other entre entrepreneurs uh, were also uh, getting into the business. There was an ice operation in Renham, Mass, and they started shipping ice to England, uh, probably from Beverly, uh, but ultimately they were not successful. Um, subsequently, England began to, uh, in, I'm sorry, subsequently Norway began to send ice to England and uh, you know, ice because of the shorter distances and other factors, it was much more economical than the American uh, product. However, if you went through the ice markets uh, in England, you would often see signs up well after Boston shipping had ended that says highest quality Boston ice, highest quality Jamaica plain ice. So it became the Kleenex, the trademark, you know, uh, for the ice industry. So the ice market in New York uh, was massive. And because of that, it had to be supported by all kinds of different operations. There wasn't any one source that could produce an, the, the amount of ice that New York needed. Um, one of the operations was on the Hudson River. I think the next slide, yes. And then they built out these special barges uh, that were used to haul ice you know, up the river. Um, for delivery. Um, ex, uh, export of ice from Boston, uh, this is international export of uh, ice from Boston, gradually uh, declined uh, because of new operations that opened up in Maine and they began to dominate the export trade. Large ice, um, ice operations were established on the Kennebec River and other locations in Maine. Maine held several advantages over Boston. Ice could be harvested from rivers in Maine and loaded directly into ships. No transport from pond to, to harbor was needed. Uh, Maine also had a longer ice season, of course, than Boston, so uh, due to its, its uh, colder climate. Okay, so here we have a very interesting picture that tells a lot about what was happening with ice harvesting in, in Jamaica Pond. You see the, uh, the, the pond is, is starting to attract recreational use. People are boating, ice skating, other recreational activities. There's this movement to establish the, the Emerald Necklace and to make the, the area park. So there's this conflict between the ice operations, which had all these horses doing what horses do, you know, yeah. and um, and all this noise and all this traffic. And so the genteel around the pond said, you know, we're not so crazy about these ice. Houses. So there's pressure on them not to expand and, and um, 
event eventually, um, you know, it led to their demise. Um, and that accelerated in 1850 when a, a number of large estates were, were broken up, broken up, and even more house lots, you know, were sold and, and more housing. So between 1850 and 1900, you know, most of Jamaica Plain was built out. Before that, there was a lot of, of these big estates. So Jamaica Plain was becoming to, to be seen more and more as a place for the, for the genteel crowd rather than, um, you know, all the noise and pollution and, and congestion. There's one interesting thing about this, um, this slide that's not immediately apparent until I tell you a little more about it. Is uh, is the person here that sent uh, an email about a um, what they thought was an ice building that was moved to their, the back of their property? Is that person here? And name's Carol and Gretchen. Tell me the name of the street McBride. on McBride Street. So she said oh, we got an email when we announced the lecture, and she said there's a um, uh, that's not her. No, that's somebody else. Okay. Um, she said that when she bought the house, there was an outbuilding in the back, and she was told that it was an ice house on Jamaica Pond, and it had been moved, you know, to the back of her house. So, um, but but it was 700 square feet, so it's not an ice house because you can see how big an ice house is. So it's several stories high, and it's yeah, it's big. But and so at first we said, ah, you know. She said, maybe it's an urban legend. We said, yeah, you know, maybe. But then I looked at this and I looked, so I looked through all the pictures that we had of the pond. And then I saw, I found this, the only picture that shows these tiny little shacks here in front of, so on the other side behind here is, is the offices. But these are shacks, maybe they were used to store the saws or the stuff for the horses and we don't know so and i don't know if they're 700 square feet i need someone better than i to figure out you know to calculate the dimensions based on what we see here but but um it could be done so we, we're thinking maybe one of these little uh, equipment sheds might have been moved backyard mcbride street and um we'd like to get over there and take a look at it so I thought that was a fun, fun little discovery. Yeah. Okay. So we have some pictures of people having fun on the pond. This is uh, 1859. And this is a, you know, was originally a large original. And it appeared, um, you know, in a pictorial magazine. And um, so the, the file is on uh, Library of Congress. And you can, like, zoom in. And, like, you know, it's like zooming into a photograph. You can see, you know, expressions on people's faces. I can't give it justice here. But it's really fun. So if you, um, if you sometime, um, we have it on our website. We have a link to it. Um, so if you look for the skating stuff, you'll find it. So that's a, it's a pretty cool image. And then the other one, this, this is 1922. So you see the dress has changed quite a bit from, uh, from 1859. But again, a lot of people, thousands of people out there having fun ice skating on Jamaica Pond. Wow. So um, the... The weather was colder back then. Um, 1880, the low temp was um, was 20 below zero. So the ice, you know, so we seldom see thick ice in the last 40 years. We saw just a few years where we've had any kind of thickness of ice. But back then, you know, you often, well, every year pretty much you got enough enough ice to, to harvest. So in addition to this, the conflict between the, the recreational use of, of, uh, of the pond and the, and the business use, uh, it, the ice business was declining for other reasons as well. By 1868, uh, they started making ice uh, through mechanical methods and the Louisiana Ice Manufacturing Company um, you know, was was set up in, I don't have the date. I, I always want to say 27, but I don't have it in front of me. So I'll say that and you can take it with a grain of salt. 
as time went on, of course, the, the refrigerator um, even replaced, uh, you know, man-made eyes and um, eventually, you know, knocked, knocked out the, um, uh, the ice business almost completely. The first domestic electric ref refrigerator was marketed in Chicago ex exhibition in 1913, or it was marketed in Chicago in 1913. I'm not strike what I said about the exhibition. Um, although both natural and artificial ice continued to be delivered to homes through the end of the Second World War. So here you see a, a more modern, almost a 50s or 40s area, you know, truck um, de delivering ice. Um, outside major metropolitan areas, uh, ice harvest did continue and um, new technologies were advanced to, con to continue the, the ancient craft. And in addition to this truck, we see a um, EV, <laughs> electric uh, powered uh, saw uh, with a, uh, a, a large electric motor and a, and a battery. And uh, so this was, this was used to, um, and then improving, improving on the electric, we have the com, com, uh, polluting uh, internal combustion engine here and looks like maybe a, a 10 horse or 15 horse, something that you would find on a, um, like, like a small riding, you know, mower. And they took that and they built a platform for it. They put that engine there and, and they mount the saw. And so you see the hand saws and, but there's, but they've adapted uh, modernized ice methods. So after the war, home refrigerators uh, soon completely displaced the use of ice in most uh, North American homes and ice harvesting industry quietly came to, to an end. It was at once both anticlimactic as it, it had been a long time coming and a shock provided by the realization that a mainstream of commerce as well as a way of life had come to end. That's it. So lights and we're gonna field some questions from the audience and some questions from, and we have our trusty president coming up to manage the process for us. So this bad one doesn't ensue. Yes, ma'am. So there are a couple questions about how many times a year did they harvest ice on the Nickel Park? So they weighed it. So the question was, how many times a year uh, was ice harvested? So they weighed it until it was thick enough, and they started to harvest. And then they would either fill up the warehouse, or they would cut all the ice on the pond, and, and they'd be done for the season. So it was just like one period. Are you, am I calling or are you calling? Oh, yeah. I'm calling. Okay, <laughs> right in the front. Uh, was there ever any disputes regarding the ice skaters versus the ice harvesting company? Like it, uh, it sounded like when you were saying, oh, ice skaters came to watch. I know if I were cutting a bunch of ice, I'd be pretty annoyed if ice skaters kept coming to see what I was doing. So the ice, so the question was about conflicts between um, um, the recreational skaters and the harvesters. So when you own property on the pond, I think you owned rights to, to a certain area in front of that property to harvest. So you know, it's sort of like a construction site. So if you're if you're walking down the street and you walk up to a construction site, you don't like walk into the construction mm -hmm. site. So it's sort of like that. So there wasn't a conflict per se, um, and they depended upon good public relations. They were selling a consumer product, so there wasn't there were, wasn't going to be a conflict between the the companies. And then someone way in the back, sir. How did they uh, keep the ice clean? I mean, you had horses 
And then you go take it at home and put them in a drink. <laughs> well, so so we had potable water in the houses because we had you know a water delivery system by then. So I said, you know, you scrape off. Well, for one thing, the the ice company itself cleaned off the ice, so they would you know get it mostly clean. And then I assume before you put it in your fridge, you would you would rinse it off, take a rag or take some water and, and clean it off. But uh, yeah. And then someone else in the front. Who owned the pond? And did the owners of the ice business have to pay a fee to the owner to utilize that resource? Yeah. I've I've always wondered that question is who who owned the pond, and I've never found an answer. Michael has an answer, has his hand up. Yes. Thank you. There were the, uh, court cases on this. The pond is a uh, public court. Can you come here so they, they can hear online? <laughs> I'll let you answer. So there were court cases, and uh, the pond is publicly owned. It's a great pond. So the pond is publicly owned. And uh, the court case said any uh, pub ice was a um, public product. Anybody could harvest it for free. So anyone could harvest free, the public product of ice on, on the ice. And nobody paid for the ice. They just paid for the labor. Um, they paid and, for the labor, uh, not the ice. Yeah. They and, took. Uh, yeah. And there were there, there are serious court cases in which Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court said ice was okay. free for harvest. It's like air. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, Charlie, there are ponds all over Massachusetts. What were the factors that made Jamaica Pond the uh, the perfect storm for this business? I mean, I don't know if it really was because you had lots of ice operations. You had big operations in Cambridge. Uh, the main thing, you know, what, what are your requirements? You know, so transportation so that you can get it to where it's going. Jamaica Plains the pond set right in, a, in a, a busy residential area. People had, had disposable income. They could afford to buy it. And... Um, but eventually they started to export it. So it, then it was more important how easily could you get it on a ship? And that's why the river ice operations, you know, took away much of the export business from, from JP. In the back. Yeah, I'm wondering about the ice mountains, how long there are substantial buildings, how long were they there? Even after business? Yeah. Well, it became a park in 19, 1890, 1890, so they would have been cleared out by then. And they they weren't really that substantial. They were just two by four structure, double walled with straw and sawdust. So uh -huh. it didn't take much to knock them down. Yeah. There's some questions about the workers. Were the workers, were the workers fairly paid? Did they, what did they, do we know what they did on those times when they weren't harvesting the ice? And were there accidents that were like, the pond So I'm sure there were accidents. I did not read about any in the Globe when I was doing this research. And, um, but it's a, it's a industrial operation. So, you know, I'm sure it was dangerous, similar to construction. Um, you're floating on a piece of ice and, you know, in a cold, pond and uh, you know you have all these saws and brakes and horses and so I'm sure I'm sure there were injuries and and, and perhaps worse uh, and the, how about how they were paid I think they were paid what a worker who uh, delivered beer would be paid it would you know whatever the the going rate for a um, for that kind of business and uh, whether or not it was a livable wage or not in in, in 1853. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, it must have been if people would take the job. Sir? Do you have any information about the ecological impact of, of the ice harvesting? It was dripping off the ice. I'm not sure what that would do to the pond itself. Um, the pond, it's a kettle, it's a, um, it's a spring fed pond. The, the spring is that if you're looking at it from, from like Perkins street, the, the, um, 
the spring is to the right, you know, that towards that end. And if you'll see in the winter when it's frozen, it'll be frozen on the left end where the ice houses are, and it'll be less frozen down where the spring is. So there's not a problem with like taking too much water from the pond because it, it gets plenished. In fact, it overflows into the other other ponds and streams along the, the emerald necklace. Um, the big ecological impact was uh, the horse manure. So, and that's why there was such a, you know, a, a movement to, to shut it, to shut down the ice operations. And then once it became a park, it, you know, all the commercial activities had to cease. You have questions on why? Yes, somebody asked, how much did a block of ice cost? No. I do not. Good question. Good question. I mean, we know what it costs per ton, but we don't know what a what a block of ice costs. So, once the ice was thick enough to start harvesting, how long did it take to, before all the ice was harvested off the pond? Was it a month? Two months? Um. You know, there is a discussion about that in one of the Globe articles. Uh, I don't have the whole article with me, so I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know exactly. Um, but I do know that it varied because it took longer to, to haul and stack thick ice than it did thin ice. So it would depend on how cold the, the, the winter was. And, and But the newspapers would report on it, you know, They've, so much of the pond is done it, and then, you know, it'll be finished, you know, by in two weeks. And so it, it varied by year. Do you know if they ever considered putting ice houses below ground for better insulation? So the first ice houses were underground, but that was expensive because we didn't have backhoes back then. We didn't have diesel engines. So... That was the first idea they tried and it worked, but it was expensive. So that's when they switched over to the uh, above ground insulated uh, buildings. And that's also interestingly, what worked well in Iran and in India, super insulated, you know, heavy wall construction. You're good over there. So, oh, you did you? you that's your second I, question. Not your multiple one. tons of ice and stack them. Uh, as you know, in your refrigerator, they tend to stick to one another. Yeah. So they must have had layers of insulation between each stacking. I th I think they uh, sprinkled sawdust between the layers. Mm -hmm. Why should What enormous block of ice? Again, no, can't have that. Here, did you make one named? Uh, after the train was Jamaica? So there, there's, an, <laughs> there's an article on the website about a lot of different thoughts about um, how Jamaica Plain was named. We do not have a authoritative answer. Um, but, but it's from the 1650s, so it's well before uh, the time frame of the trade with the So that one's probably not right. <laughs> and then the one that we tend to um, give credence to is? There was a, a indigenous leader called Pet Jamaican and his Anglicized name was Chief Jamaica and he mostly lived on the uh, head of the Neponset River but also came to the Ponset. So this area would have been known as a place that he was associated with. But there are many theories and we don't really know is the, the right answer. Okay. Well, this isn't a question, it's just a piece of information. This is an ice house up in Gloucester. And I don't know about now, but pre-COVID, they were heroes of the Wow. <laughs> Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So um, there is a ice house in Gloucester that you can go visit, and they, they give tours. And presumably, they harvest ice there, too, and they put it in the ice house. So you can, <laughs> you can see the whole process, at least how it's, how it's done today. So that's very cool. Here. Uh, how are the ships? Uh, insulated for this for this voyage, like India, they, they must have been specially equipped for that. Uh, sawdust and straw. So and, you, and any kind of a double wall sort of thing, or just they use with the sawdust? my my understanding is they use standard ships. They they were not special, you know, insulated ships. So because they they lost half the yeah. if they would have been well insulated, they would have kept ninety percent of the product, but they lost half of it. 
on the voyages. So, Ma'am? Do you know how they started to make artificial lines? I mean, they, the technology? Yeah, I mean, they didn't have electric, electric refrigeration at that point, right? So how could they, how could they lower the temperature of the water enough for the air to not be Right, so, so you had, you know, you had a, a number of ways to to produce mechanical energy. So you could produce it with a steam engine, you could produce mechanical energy with um, by burning a, a gas. And so once you have the ability to, to run a pump, then you can compress a fluid like ammonia or freon. They didn't have freon, but you know, and then you could use that to to have refrigeration. So in a nutshell, in two sentences, but that's how they did it. So don't but don't ask me to fix your refrigerator. <laughs> Can't do it. Yes. Charlie, you mentioned that the one of the ways the ice king became so wealthy and really took off was because <coughs> there was the need for ice because there was yellow fever in I forget which Caribbean country, Martinique maybe. Right. So what was the how was ice used to combat yellow fever? I think it was just to comfort people to, you know, help help them cool off. You know, like ice packs, that kind of thing. I haven't read anything else about it. All the way back. You know what the difference in temperature, daily temperature might have been uh, from the mid 1800s to now? Well, well, in the last 40 years that I recall, it's never been below seven degrees below zero. That was like the, the coldest I remember. So back then, you know, you'd be at like 20 below zero. The exact figures, I, I don't have the medium medium temps, but uh, but it's significant. It's not a couple of degrees. It's it's a lot. So maybe maybe 10 or 15 degrees. Another point of information on the interpreter docent at the Hancock Shaker Village in Western Massachusetts. We had the 19th century ice house that combined the location can you technology. can you come over you, you have 100 people 100 more people that want to hear this so uh, stand, other than you repeating it stand, stand one. so i'm again a docent at the hancock shaker village in western massachusetts we love to welcome visitors to our 19th century ice house that combines the two technologies it's built on a hillside so the ice was brought in at the top and then stacked down below on the underground um, is the lower part of the slope. So it did in fact do everything that these ice houses did, kept the ice year round. They didn't do much exporting because they had up to 300 people using it all year round. So come and see us. <laughs> You learn all kinds of things at these meetings. I gotta come to these meetings more often, sir. Can you talk a, a little bit more? You mentioned at one point um, the difference. You now there was a debate about the quality depending on how they harvested. Um, can you just explain that a little bit better? Um, so for some applications, clear ice was important. So if you were using the sink the pond method, I don't know if the ice would be as clear as if you scraped the snow off the top and got and got got rid of it. Um, but for other applications, it doesn't have consumer or visual you know issues. If you're in the back room someplace keeping beer cold, then you know they wouldn't care if it's clear or not. So you know different qualities of ice for different purposes, perhaps. <laughs> Glad you could come. I see we have no other questions. There are still questions in the back of the room. Thank you all who stood during the program. We had no idea that many people were still in person. Don't hear about other things that we're doing. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>